Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art Fight Podcast. My name is Joe Nolan. I'm here with my co-host, Brian Siskin. Uh, we have an exciting show uh, for you guys going on today. Uh, it's one of those shows that fits perfectly right in between our two uh, our two passions for uh, art and fighting. Um, you know, when we think of the art world, we're often thinking of the fine art world, the museum world, the gallery world. We talk about the fight world. We're not only just talking about the combat sports world, but we're also talking about things like the action film world and uh, the, even the comic book world. And for me, uh, today's guest, uh, like I said, you know, just hits the hits the bullseye as far as the kind of themes that we like to talk about on this show. Um, when you think of Conan the Barbarian, uh, your head is immediately filled with images. And nine times out of ten, those images are by or influenced by the artist Frank Frazetta. And today's guest is uh, J. David Spurlock of Vanguard Publishing, and he's here to talk to us uh, about a whole bunch of uh, comic book history, a whole bunch of uh, inside uh, uh, perspectives regarding Frank Frazetta and his art, and also to talk about his new book, which is called The Fantastic Paintings of Frank Frazetta. J. David Spurlock, welcome to the Art Fight Podcast. Thanks for having me. How you doing today, Brian? Doing great, man. Doing I've great. Got Brian, uh, Brian's flying the ship. We got everybody connected here. David, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I, I know, you know, just the other day we did a little technical test to make sure we could all uh, uh, have a smooth chat this afternoon. Um, and 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 even even over the twenty minutes we were uh, together uh, uh, a couple days ago, uh, we just started diving off into all these different avenues. But but uh, just to kind of catch our re- our uh, our listeners up uh, on uh, on who you are and and what Vanguard publishing is. Can you give us a little bit of an introduction? Well, uh, I got out of school in the 70s and started working as an illustrator in Texas. And I had gotten into the arts through being inspired as a kid reading comics in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, But at that time was actually uh, uh, still free faxes and free FedEx. And so you had to still live within commuting distance to New York to work in the comics so as I was in, in Dallas, I started working in advertising and illustration, editorial illustration, magazine illustration, advertising and graphic design. But my love of comics, heroic fantasy, including Frazetta's, Duranko, Jack Kirby, Wally Wood, just John Buscema, any long number of the greats, all-time greats, yeah. uh, always there. And I wasn't just inspired by their work to do my own artwork. I also wanted to get to know them personally and to present them in a new light, not just as a work, uh, a guy working to illustrate a script, but to show them, to show pop art as true art, as fine mm-hmm. art. And so eventually that led to me publishing uh, of my art and other artists' uh, work. And I started with a uh, comic called Tales from the Edge anthology which was kind of a hybrid between kind of a strange comic like uh throwback to ec like weird science or tales from the crypt and yeah, then right. an, and an avant-garde art mag and we had top illustrators like baron story and uh, marshall erisman and bill sinkevich and and others who we would show what they didn't always get to show commercially, what they weren't necessarily getting assignments for, but what was dear to their heart. It was really art for art's sake. But on rare occasion, we'd do an issue that was devoted to a single artist, and those were actually the only issues that made money. So I'm like, wow. okay, well, I can definitely fill the void. There were no books at that time. When I was getting started, well, I moved to the New York area in the mid-'90s, mm-hmm. and there were practically no artist sketchbooks then. I really led the, the, the whole artist sketchbook boom. We started with uh, Al Williamson's sketchbook, the Neil Adams' sketchbook, uh, uh, Jeff Jones' sketchbook, Wally Wood's sketchbook, John Romita, John Buscema, et cetera, and more recently, multiple volumes of Frazetta sketchbook. Mm-hmm. And now, lots of artists have a sketchbook out, but at that time, it, there were only like three that had ever been done and they were by multiple different publishers. So so Vanguard was the first one to launch a series of what we call the popular artist sketchbook series. And that led to even more elaborate productions that I, I would call a career retrospective. Mm-hmm. And 
Uh, and so uh, that's kind of, but one thing that's unique about us is we're not just, most publishers, they're in business, they may like the subject uh, of what they're publishing, but it's primarily business. Everything we've done is actually connected to promoting the arts, promoting the artists, and, and artist rights. I had in Dallas, I was the president of the Dallas Society of Illustrators, so that was key in forming and educating artists was key to that, having, uh, being able to congregate and talk with other artists. Before that, if you go back to like the 60s and before, it was, it was very difficult. You know, uh, uh, doing artwork for a living is a solitary job. And it's mm -hmm. important with other artists to get information from them and find out what's going on in the industry from others. Uh, so, so that was important, and that all comes into... Uh, and my teaching, too. I started teaching at the University of Texas uh, before I moved to the New York area. We're losing you there, David. Can you hear him, Brian? Uh, no, I think we lost you, David. Can't hear you. Just for the last bit there. The mic uh, seems to be acting weird. It was all good for most of that. <laughs> yeah. Still can't hear you. No. Hello, hello. This is what it is to be live, y'all. That's right. Well, let David, uh, well, let David, did we just lose him in general? Uh, it looks like his image is frozen. Okay, well, let's. Uh, I know that you're on that, Brian, and I'll just uh, take a second here to comment on some of the things David was talking about. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, is uh, really interesting and, and really ties back into our talk with Wayne White a few weeks ago is that, um, you know, in, in both these conversations recently, we've talked about how, um, you know, artists like, uh, like Andy Warhol, for instance, uh, you know, broke down these barriers between. Um, you know, what was considered to be fine art, again, as I was talking about in the introduction, you know, art that you'd go see at a museum, art that you see in a fine art gallery and whatnot, um, and popular art. And I think that, um, you know, David is very much like Wayne in the sense that, you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, not only, you know, sort of coming up during the same time, but coming up in New York during the same times um, and, and finding out about how, you know, it's, it sounds like, uh, you know, David was in New York in the 90s around the same time that Wayne was in New York. And um, let's check in with Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> David, can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, he's, oh OK. He's back. OK. All I'm right. Not sure what we're, but we're back. That's all right. So this is that's why this is um this is this is the fun. That's the fun in all this, right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No harm done, David. <laughs> I was just talking about how how I think it's interesting that that you know you um uh you know came you know came into uh, art and especially into you know comics and things like that during a time when they've made this like really in incredible transition from being you know, art for kids or art that's, uh, you know, printed on, uh, you know, the back of a newspaper or something like that to the point where, you know, it's really crossed over into being something that's taken very seriously and, and even considered fine art. Yes. And I mean, that's what Vanguard really is all about. You know, we mm -hmm. use top quality paper, heavier weight paper than other people. There, there was a long running magazine, uh, called the Comics, uh, Comics Buyer's Guide, CBG. And I think every that I think every book of ours, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. I think every book of ours that they ever reviewed, they said this is a labor of love. This is obviously a labor of love. Well, that's because they knew what sales were. We lost you again. Oh man, we lost you again, David. Uh, <laughs> can you see him? I can see David, but I cannot hear oh, him. Oh, good. Good. I can hear. I I can hear him when he comes <laughs> through, but I can't see him. So, one way or another, we're going to make this all work out. Um. 
But yeah, I'm interested in hearing more about that. You know, he, David's getting back to talk about how for Vanguard, these works were a labor of love. And I think that that, uh, you know, seems to show through from the things that he's been sending us. Uh, we've been getting, uh, uh, you know, a, a sl basically uh, there's there's no review copies of the book available at this point. So David's been sending us a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, JPEG images and PDF, uh, uh, you know, uh, files and things so that we can essentially get a feel for what this book is. And, uh, uh, and, and if you look through the, the, the online site for the Vanguard book catalog, um, there's a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, projects that obviously th there's, there's a sense of being inside, you know, like these, like, you know, people like David know the, that those artists and they know that art and they know that world. And it's not just, uh, people from the outside trying to, you know, present a you product or something. David, are you back? Yeah. Okay. Go on, David. You're talking about how these books are a labor of love for you guys at Vanguard. Well, they were, but I, I was saying I had a certain faith that if we were going to, you know, make it, we were going to invest that extra mile as early as possible to put more into the product, give a better quality product, and that eventually, you know, that would build up the brand recognition that oh, they're doing superior quality products over here, and they're presenting the work not as comics related but as just art related, mm -hmm. even though most of the artists that we focus on have at some time in their career, if they're not primarily known for their, their comics career, they have at least at some time. But I really like artists that work in lots of areas, like Jim Steranko is a good example. He worked in film, he worked in illustration, graphic design, and comics. Uh, for the same thing with Frazetta, or Alex Toth, or Al... Uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people like that, or Dave McKean or Bill Sienkiewicz. You mm -hmm. know, these people are very talented and versatile, and they can work, they have worked in all kinds of media. Right. And for many artists, I mean, you know, there's, uh, the, uh, you know, that's just the way it is for most artists. Like, you know, some, about half the people who uh, listen to this podcast are very familiar with the art world or artists in their own right. Uh, but for the other half of the people who listen to this podcast or other listeners that we have out there who don't understand like what, you know, being an artist is about, I mean, for, for a lot of artists, it's about being versatile like that. It's about being up for the challenge of how can you, you know, pay your bills while you're doing the projects that maybe will pay off later, uh, how you can like, you know, uh, use, uh, you know, uh, commissioned works and, and work for hire in order to subsidize the fine art that you're doing and things like that. I, I love the idea that you're actually committed to putting out pro <laughs> quality, right? I mean, uh, a lot of what keeps, I think, a lot of people from even pursuing, you know, publishers. And I think in a lot of areas is because they know that what they, the, the, the value of what they're, they're making and the assertions they're making artistically are just not going to be replicated in a way that gives credence to the work. It's tough, but we, we've get, we've get buyers that come up and say, Oh, I'm so glad you did this and not this company because they create new flat color for, say, for instance, if we're re we did a collection of Rosetta's uh, comics work called uh, White Indian, and uh, there was some talk that another publisher was going to do something. Well, they were creating new flat color, and they were knocking it out. You know, it, whereas we have kind of state of the art techniques to reproduce the original color. One reason you didn't traditionally see that is because of what is called moray patterns. Do you know what a moray pattern is? When right. you combine when you combine the first printing's dot pattern with the new printing's dot pattern, they go together to make like an op art effect. Well, that's not a good thing. This is not a place we're not trying to create an op art effect at that place. Right. And so uh, traditionally, if someone had no choice but to reproduce from an old artifact. All they could do is blur it a little bit and hope for the pray for the best. Or they would bleach out the color and then do new color. But when you bleach out the color, some of the black line work is going to go with it. And mm -hmm. so that was, it was always a, a big problem. And over some years, we've developed a, a, a series of techniques that we use to uh, where we can reproduce artifacts you know, with very very good quality. Yeah, that to me, I mean, you know, uh, Brian and I are both musicians and we're, we talk to musicians a lot. Brian's a filmmaker and we talk to filmmakers a lot. And whenever it comes to reproducing work, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's a big deal when you've 
you know, uh, put in the time and the effort and the, the focus and attention and the money and everything else to make something. And then when it's, you know, pr mass produced in some way or printed or whatever, and it comes off as something less than what you intended it to be, it's a real heartbreaker for an artist. So, so taking the time and the attention to, to, to really get this high fidelity reproduction is, I mean, it's a big deal for the artists and it's a big deal to collectors who know the difference, right? Oh, yes. Uh, some of these, well, like with the new book, you know, Frank passed away in 2010. And, you know, some people seem to hold out a dream that a new new book is going to uh, one day magically appear of all never before seen material. That's of the quality of his finest work he ever produced. Well, we actually did multiple volumes of primarily unpublished works, and those are the two volumes we've done so far for Zeta Sketchbook. And and we may do more volumes of for Zeta Sketchbook. But those those type of jobs, it's like archaeology. You're you're digging for rare art artifacts that uh, have never been seen. And uh, when you come to a commercial artist or illustrator, a lot of times those unseen works are in some way a preliminary for some other it, it may have evolved into another piece that that was published and and the few people who have done sketchbooks other than us uh, that have done the the these historic searched out these artifacts now I'm not talking about say for instance an animator if you go to San Diego comic-con there are tons of great animators out there doing sketchbooks of their work that you don't see on the screen mm -hmm. and they do fabulous work but those are, it's fairly new material. It's not like we're looking at an artist's career and pulling out never, be seen, never seen before works from an artist to a lengthy career, like somebody like Frazetta or Al Williamson or Wally Wood or Jim Stranko or people like that. So we're doing that and we did that. But um, when it comes to the top quality finished oil paintings, say for instance of Frazetta, you know, most of those have been seen and some have been seen a number of times. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how can we show it to people as it's never been seen before? And uh, they want to, you know, I, I want to smell the oil. You ever mm -hmm. been around someone painting oil paints? Mm -hmm. I want to smell the oil paint. I want to smell whether it's linseed oil or even the turpentine <laughs> or mineral spirits. You know, get get that experience, you know. Um, and I on this new book, there's a couple pages every now and then I'm like, I can almost smell the oil. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Or I'll tell people, you know, you can see the texture of the canvas. You know, now Frank didn't paint real thick very often. Sometimes he would do a build up uh, under what they call an underpainting, like say, for instance, take a palette knife and build up some texture with gesso or modeling paste and then paint on top of it for a, a rocky effect, a, a wall of rocks or something like that, or the or a, a planet, you know, a different texture for a planet in the sky or something like that, like on a John Carter paintings. Um, but most of the time he didn't lay the paint on real thick, like what you would call impasto. Mm -hmm. But um, but on those rare occasions, you know, it's nice to get close enough. You can actually see like the strokes, you know, not just the color of the stroke, but any kind of dimensional quality within that stroke. And so the new book is uh, bigger than it, uh, physically larger trim size than it's not the most number of pages. It's the largest trim size of any Frazetta book ever published before. Here's a quick glance. And this is, um, the piece on the cover is called Egyptian Queen. Awesome. <laughs> and that piece sold at auction, the original art sold at auction uh, not too long ago for $5.4 million. And that was, a, that was a new record. And Frazetta has, has set uh, a number of records. And that, that piece, I have a quote in the book from one of the Star Wars uh, costume designers uh, citing Frazetta's design work as an influence on some of the Star Wars designs, particularly the uh, the Leia costume uh, when Jabba the oh, Hutt yeah. had her. And uh, there's also there was also a, a, a costume that Cher had probably in the 90s. I think she was hanging out with Gene Simmons for a little while. <laughs> Gene Simmons is real into this stuff. 
and uh, and I've I've talked to Gene about a couple different about musicians that we we both knew or about comics artists uh, that uh, whose work he admires like Wally Wood and Jim Steranko. but um, I the word was that that this one share costume that was obviously inspired by Frazetta's work you know that that Gene Simmons was talking up Frazetta's work and that kind of led to that in some brief period that the share and, and Gene were hanging out. Uh, there was also a great Rolling Stone cover with J-Lo in a mm -hmm. Frazetta-inspired outfit, uh, complete with a wild cat. That's a great formula for Frazetta, is the sexy woman and the wild cat. The danger, <laughs> the sexy and the danger combination. <laughs> That's fantastic, and and I, I know you see... You see his influence in movies all the time. You see his influence, like you're saying, in fashion and photography. And, I mean, really, when it's when it's all said and done, even though there are some artists, like I'm thinking of some artists that are associated with, like, Lord of the Rings and stuff, at the end of the day, in many ways, when it comes to, you know, fantasy imagery, Frazetta is the king, oh, just oh, not just of... You know, like you're talking about the John Carter paintings, the Conan paintings, things like that that he's you know specifically known for. But it's just in general, when you start thinking of sword and sorcery art, uh, you know, you just he's the first guy you think of. What can you tell us about uh, about his story? Like, how did he come to be? How did he come to be that guy? Well, specifically on the um, the Lord of the Rings, I wanted to mention the orcs uh -huh. and and the death rites. Those are like straight, straight from Frazetta. You know, mm -hmm. they're 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 not straight. They're not like they're not copied. The costume design is not copied straight right. out of the painting. But you can't deny the influence of Frazetta in there. What the the situation that we have, uh, I as an author, historian, and the Frazetta family, is really educating a new generation because mm -hmm. they see these images. And they don't, they don't know, you know, Boris compared to Ken Kelly, Jeffrey Jones, Frazetta, Alex Horley, uh, Simon Bisley. You know, it's all some sort of savage, barbaric art to them. And they don't know the history. And the history is it actually all comes back to this guy, Frazetta. That's, uh -huh. he's, he's the big bang of uh, uh, sword and sorcery art, heroic fantasy art. Now, I can cite... You know who were influences on Frazetta? Hal Foster that did the Tarzan newspaper strip, and then the Prince Valiant strip. He was a, a great influence on early Frazetta. But you see that influence more in Frazetta's early comic book work in the fifties. Mm -hmm. You don't tend to see it in the paintings because because most people never got to see a Hal Foster oil painting. Now I did do a book on Hal Foster, and there are some oil paintings in there. But that's when I gifted that book to Frazetta. It was written by Brian Kane. Excellent book. Won uh, uh, awards. Got news coverage across America and Canada. Um, when I gifted a copy of that book to Frazetta, and he really loved it, and he's looking through it. He didn't. He wasn't saying a lot. He's looking through it. And then he gets up, he walks over to his own bookshelf. He starts thumbing through the bookshelf. And, uh, and he pulls the book out. He says, you got this? I'm like, yeah, Frank, I got that. Starts thumbing through. He pulls another book out of his work. You got this? I'm like, yeah, Frank, I got that. I said, Frank, I got all your books. I've been buying your books since the 60s. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I should have taken the book anyway. It took me a while to figure out he was going to reciprocate. You know, I gifted him a book that he liked. People gifted Frank, anyone that came to see Frank, they'd gift him something. It was very rare that he cared enough about, you could have filled trailers and, and storage units full of the gifts that, that he was given over the years. But uh, for him to actually look to reciprocate, that was that was a, an honor. And I, I, I was kind of slow on the uptake on that one. But <laughs> he, he would have he inscribed it to me. And his signature alone goes for $200. You know, Not that I would sell it. But right. I'm like, oh, gee, you know, I look back now and I'm like, gee, Frank, yeah, I'd love to have a couple of those inscribed. <laughs> That's amazing. But yeah, the influence, so he did come, you can trace, also J. Allen St. John, and I did a book on St. John. I actually did two books on St. John, one of, of drawings and one on paints. That's the original great Edgar Rice Burroughs illustrator from, mm. from, the, from the 20s and 30s. Wow. Okay? 
and he was Burroughs' favorite illustrator. And there were some very famous people who did some Burroughs paintings. N.C. Wyeth, uh, Frank Schoonover are probably the two most notable uh, Golden Age illustrators that did uh, some, uh, some Edgar Rice Burroughs work. But Burroughs preferred St. John because he could tell there was a drama there, there was a passion there, and that St. John was really into it. Uh, for the other guys, they always did excellent work, but it's, it's, another, it's another job. You know, it wasn't like mm -hmm. they just clicked on Burroughs' subject matter. St. John did. And St. John, uh, Frank told me that when he was a kid, he discovered St. John. He had an uncle who had some of the first edition uh, Tarzan hardcovers from mm -hmm. the 1920s. And, and Frank said when he first saw him, he loved the pictures, and it, he couldn't even read. That's how young he was when he discovered mm. them. And then he said he come, came back a few years later after he learned to read, and then he read the stories, and he loved the stories too. Uh, so Burroughs and the illustrations for Burroughs were, were inspiring. He also liked uh, Disney films, including Fantasia is frequently cited. Uh, and he liked humorous work, too. In his own time, spare time, he would tend to do, like, little humorous and sexy cartoons, sometimes gifts for his wife or Valentine's Day cards or whatever. But, uh, you know, in his own time, he, he would frequently tend to do uh, humorous stuff. And he had a big boom in the 60s doing uh, caricature-based movie posters. And mm -hmm. these were these were top movies, uh, Yours, Mine, and Ours with uh, Henry Fonda and Lucille Ball, or After the Fox with Victor Mature and uh, Woody Allen and all kinds of people. Ursula Andress, uh, he, he did a lot of The Night They Raided Minsky's. That was a big, younger people may not recognize that title. That was a big movie. Uh, in fact, his The Night They Raided Minsky's was meant to be risque. Uh, it was humorous, tongue-in-cheek, playful, risque movie, but, you know, uh, Maybe it had R rating uh, in the 60s. Well, his first draft of that poster was too risque. And they, <laughs> and, they, uh, and they required a number of changes. Well, we run the original version in the new book, and we run it the largest it's ever been seen anywhere. Uh, this is the uncensored. I don't, I don't have anything marked in advance. And unfortunately, your, your listeners that, that don't get to see it won't. But... It's out there. The book's out there. Um, so we took, we ran the original uncensored version, the largest it's ever run. The book is about uh, um, 10 and a half by 14 and a half. So on a poster or an, a painting that's horizontal like Minsky's, we ran that as a two page spread. So it's actually running like 21 inches wide. And uh, that's, that's a pretty healthy size for, uh, for a book. This is the uh, Minsky's. Oh. And so they're basically raiding a, a, a uh, exotic dancer show. <laughs> and, uh, the cops are loading them all into paddy wagon, all the strippers and dancers. Uh, but there were, there were some little details in there that the, the movie people said, nah, that one's we can't have any of that. It's you're gonna too much. It's so funny how like like what's so benign to the eye now, right? You know, versus then. Yeah. It's 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 amazing. So I have a quick question. Do you, uh, for those that aren't familiar with with Frazetta's work, and you're trying to relay, you know, and you've done a great job of this so far, just to relay sort of his impact on a lot of other culture and and media and film and everything. If if you were if you were somebody that say like a, a musician uh, or a filmmaker or somebody that's in a different realm, who would he be sort of like akin to? Because I feel like he invented a visual language, right? That became the basis for a lot of things that a lot of people don't realize. Like you were saying earlier, is is the de facto visual language. Now it doesn't mean that he didn't he in, he didn't invent every aspect of it, but he was the first person to synthesize it and express it in a particularly cohesive way. I, I think one person I'd go to would be Jimi Hendrix mm. because it, it was absolutely revolutionary. When that first uh, Conan paperback cover came out with the Frazetta cover, I, I was there. I was a kid at the time, but I saw it fresh, and nobody had seen anything like it, not even from Frazetta. You can, you can look at some earlier pieces. There were a couple of Tarzan pieces he did before that where he had a similar composition – uh, a, a mass of defeated foes at his feet, kind of an A composition, big triumphant. Uh, but 
he captured an atmosphere there that nobody had ever seen. And this character that he he painted, or he would say created, because he said his character, and a lot of people have said his the character he painted was very different from the character that Robert E. Howard wrote about. And but it came to be adopted. You know, the guy who managed the the Howard writing uh, estate at the time. Um, he, you know, he pointed out that Howard said he had a kind of a, a bob cut or a square main cut, and 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 it was compared to say a, a Prince Valiant, you know mm-hmm. that, and that was considered long hair at the time. But all of a sudden, Frazetta comes in and he's got hair down to uh, to uh, his his chest, his back, or his solar plexus, and 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 he had scars all over him. Nobody had seen. <laughs> Thing like that before, you know, <laughs> veins popping out. He would do hit though a little green in the abdomen. I remember the first time I saw a major finished oil painting by Frazetta. I was a teenager at the time, and there was a velvet rope, and you couldn't get any closer. And a couple friends of mine had traveled to see this, the uh, our first Frazetta original, and were kind of leaning over the ropes. I said, "Oh, nobody could get away with doing that, but Frazetta, you know." But it was revolutionary, and, and but also with Hendrix, he was revolutionary. Some people on the outside would see the material as actually violent. When he would perform live, you know, he's smashing the guitar, or he's setting it on fire, or he's humping the amp, uh, and and there's a a percussive attack, a physical attack, and and anytime I mention this era in music. You know, I want to throw cream in there too, because uh, Clapton with cream was doing the same thing. He just did; they just didn't do the flashy showmanship, you mm-hmm. know, playing behind the the head and stuff like that. But if you listen to the actual music, and if you see the the, the farewell cream concert from '68, they discuss that, saying, you know, talking about Clapton's talking about violence in the music, and he says, uh, and he compares it to Pete Townsend. Uh, he didn't mention Hendrix in that interview, but he compares it to Pete Townsend, who was also smashing guitars. And the interviewer says, well, can you give us an example of that now? He says, what, you want me to smash the guitar? <laughs> and he says, no, quite that, but an example of violence in your style. I said, okay, so he starts attacking the guitar. But uh, so... And Ginger, is... Ginger Baker also. I just, I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, talk about a, pri- a primal uh, sort of continuum of violence. That That was Ginger Baker. Yeah, and most okay. And we got to mention there's only one more guy to mention. That's Jack Bruce, who wrote and sang the large majority of those songs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it was a personal friend of mine. Mm. Uh, so, um, but that is a great example because they were breaking all the rules, but they had roots in a grand tradition. They mm. knew what made good music. They were just taking taking it a quantum leap forward and presenting it to. Uh, you know, largely a, a teen and twenties uh, audience that that wanted to be shocked, that wanted to be amazed, that wanted to be to walk out of that place just going, "Wow, what what in the world was that?" And so, to to a large extent, Frazetta was doing a similar thing in the in the sixties as well. Yeah, that's fantastic, man. I I love I love the way that you you know were able to draw parallels between all those things. And and I I you know uh, doing the research for this I've come across the same uh, the same information regarding Frazetta uh, you know versus Frazetta's Conan versus uh, uh, Robert E Howard's Conan and that ultimately when it was all said and done Frazetta's Conan was just so uh, just so indelible and undeniable that essentially you know like like I said at the in the introduction that's what. That's who Conan is now for anyone. You know what I mean? Anybody who's interested in the Barbarian, they're mm. interested in Frazetta's Barbarian. That's that's the that's the gateway to Conan. If anyone has not, <laughs> as, if anyone has not seen the most recent Conan film with Jason Momoa, I highly recommend it. It was not a huge box office smash, but Jason, I know Jason, and he he knows Conan. His parents were artists. They knew Frazetta stuff, and he grew up. Uh, being exposed to that and was inspired by it. And we have a, a quote to that effect that we run in the book. We also have a nice quote from Schwarzenegger. Uh, Schwarzenegger said something along the lines of, uh, you know, there's very few times in my life I've been intimidated. But I have to tell you, looking at Frazetta's painting, that's intimidating. 
<laughs> uh, so because both of them felt like the challenge is to present Frazetta on camera. Good luck. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see you try. Let's, we, we would love to see you try. And and Arnold and uh, Momoa are, you know, I think they were both, you know, uh, uh, very good for those parts. So just like anything else that you that you love and that you feel like is the original, are there sort of factions or sort of resultant movements or things that have come from Frazetta's impact that you feel, uh, not that I am asking like for you to step on anybody else or anything, but are there things that you feel like are trying to carry on that spirit, but perhaps in vain in some way, and maybe there's something more visceral that they're missing or something about his essence that they're missing? I don't know about, I don't know about in vain. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't put that in there, but you know, one thing that comes readily to mind is heavy metal magazine. And I think that heavy metal magazine has seen a resurgence in the last couple of years. There's been some changes, some editorial staff changes and different things. Um, and when we, I do a lot of, uh, convention appearances and I talk to a lot of people and when they see the Frazetta, a lot of times people who don't necessarily the na know the name but know the subject matter and know a, a certain look, they're like, they look at it like Heavy Metal Magazine. They believe that Frazetta, Frizz there are some issues with Frazetta covers and there's uh, a couple with fr articles about Frazetta, but many of the readers believe there is more Frazetta that's run as covers to Heavy Metal than there is because his work influenced so many other artists and that's the perfect venue for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I mean, you could, it's like trying to take sex and violence and turn it into something uh, that is exquisite. And n no one has done it. I, there are some superb examples. Uh, and I named a number of those artists earlier, uh, Boris Vallejo, Julie Bell, um, uh, Simon Bisley, Jeffrey Jones, uh, um, Ken Kelly. Ken Kelly did uh, a couple of top Kiss album covers uh, that he's famous for. And uh, uh, Frazetta, a lot of people that may not know the name, they'll recognize some album covers um, by, uh, was it Flirting with Disaster? Who did that? The Southern Rock Band? Uh, 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 38, or no, um, no, Molly, Molly Hatchet. Uh, Molly Hatchet. Yeah. He, there's, uh, I think there were three Molly Hatchet covers, and Frank got gold record awards for those album covers. And uh, one of them, I think, sold a million copies, and the other one sold, I believe, two million copies. That may, that's some of the broadest exposure that Frank actually had, because the paperback covers that really made him famous in the 60s and 70s, um, they were their print runs for maybe a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. Those are very healthy numbers, you know. In the publishing world today, good luck, you know, coming up with something that's going to go a hundred to two hundred thousand copies. But they were selling, they were doing print runs between a hundred and two hundred thousand copies. There's a big difference between a hundred, two hundred, there's uh, two two hundred thousand copies and a million or two million copies. And those mm -hmm. Molly Hatchet covers had a million to two million copies out there yeah they're in every every used record bin in every record store ever right it's you, you can't you can't go shopping for used records and not flip past that record yeah i and i know a lot of people you know there's an old story about people who in, including the uh in the documentary there's an unreleased documentary on conan uh there are some trailers for it available on the internet and um, the publisher of Dark Horse Comics is on there, and he's saying, like many people, it was the Frazetta covers that brought him to Robert E. Howard and Conan. And and a lot of people, you know, studied and studied those covers long before they read the stories. But the good thing is, Howard was a great writer. Howard deserves what I like to say is Howard created the sword and sorcery literary genre. But Frazetta created the sword and sorcery visual genre. And so they were a perfect combination. They were very, very powerful. Those Howard stories had been around since the 30s. They ran in Pulp Magazine Weird Tales. 
and uh, the first covers were was actually by a woman, which is very rare for a woman to be sex, doing sexy pulp covers in the 30s, but Margaret Brundage. Uh, I did an award-winning book on Margaret Brundage. I, I heavily recommend, highly recommend. And um, but, and there were other great artists. Uh, the Conan material got reprinted in hardcovers in the 50s, and they had a number of top artists. Uh, Kelly Freeze was a top science fiction illustrator, did uh, a cover. Impsch uh, was another top uh, illustrator of the time. Uh, Wally Wood. Uh, who did uh, all kinds of things, including creating the red Daredevil costume for Marvel. And right. uh, he also did Weird Science and Tales from the Crypt and things like that and Mad Magazine for EC, coming out of the 50s into the 60s uh, with Mad. And uh, he did the uh, Conan piece there in the 50s. So there were top artists who had addressed the character, but they were selling the, uh, I think the print runs uh, off the top of my head, uh, on the the weird tales, I think were about fifty thousand. But magazine print runs, a lot of that stuff gets returned. Uh, they did have a couple of issues that sold out with Brundage covers, Brundage Robert E. Howard related covers. So fifty thousand there in the thirties, and then in the fifties, I think they were only running about fifteen thousand hmm. of those hard covers. And it, I think it varied a little bit from one to another. But now when Frazetta came in. It just blew the roof off of it. And we were doing the numbers I mentioned earlier, 100,000, 200,000. But compared to 15,000 just 10 years earlier, that mm -hmm. is a unbelievable difference. And it was the success of those covers that inspired Marvel to want to pick up the license to do a Conan comic. Mm -hmm. And then the combination of the Frazetta paperback covers and paperback, the covered paperbacks, and then the Marvel comics inspired movie producers to get interested in doing a Conan uh, movie. Uh, so you can you can tie it all to Frazetta. You know, of course, if you're talking about Conan, you're also talking about Robert E. Howard. Mm -hmm. But Frazetta did that same thing with other things. The reason he got that assignment was he had already revitalized Edgar Rice Burroughs' material prior to that. But he was upset with the publisher who was hiring him to do Burroughs. He loved Burroughs. He actually read Burroughs. He didn't really read Howard. He read just enough of it to figure out, hey, this is a vehicle I can use for the to to unleash my most savage art that I had, <laughs> had the the call for before, you know. To and and I don't know if I quite got it out earlier, but when that first book came out. And we saw it on the stands like we didn't know if it was a man or a monster. We didn't know what it was, but we had to buy that book to find out. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Go ahead, Joe. I was just going to say, no, I really I think that's interesting. And I really love I, I, I really love the, the idea of how, uh, you know, artists can connect in that way where, you know, you've got somebody like Robert E. Howard is writing these books. And then along comes this artist who's already got this you know aesthetic sort of in his back pocket and he's just looking for the right opportunity and then lo and behold this other guy's writing becomes the perfect 30 milieu year, 30 years later yeah not not only did a, so he he revitalized the Edgar Rice Burroughs material and then he takes on Howard he, he revitalizes the, t the Howard that that originally had been published 30 years later because of that those combinations and Burroughs Burroughs was in Pulps, too, but he was so popular, he quickly started getting full-length novels published mm -hmm. in hardcover as early as the, the 20s. And, and so he was very highly regarded. You know, Tarzan, John Carter Mars, Pellucidar, all kinds of creators, creations there. Same thing with uh, Howard, but Howard died young, and that material was basically limited to those Weird Tales pulp mag scenes for a long time until Frazetta did so much to revitalize them in the 60s, which started the snowball that led to all the other media, television shows. There was an animated cartoon, you know. How can you sell your kids Lucky Charms and Conan at the same time? That's kind of <laughs> tough. That's kind of tough. Here you go, kids. <laughs> Eat your Lucky Charms before I slit your throat. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's hilarious. I think, but I think you know the the you know the the chronology here is interesting because I think it it really uh, reinforces your your rock and roll analogies because when you think about you know somebody like Jimi Hendrix or the Who or the Rolling Stones or any of those bands of that era, all those guys were were looking into the American blues music of the '30s and 30 years later revitalizing right. it with this electrified there's, there's roots. you know. Uh, uh, this electrified savagery, and and that's essentially what what uh, what uh, you, what you're saying. Uh, Frazetta was able to do with Howard's music. I mean, yeah, Howard's nobody, uh, writing. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody's nobody's born in a vacuum. Everybody's mm-hmm. got some kind of roots. I like to think of it as we had when I was teaching at School of Visual Arts in New York. A lot of the students they were hesitant to even look at other artists' work. Mm-hmm. They were afraid that if they looked at other artists' work, that that they wouldn't be original. I'm like, no, you'll just be ignorant. Okay, <laughs> you won't you won't be original because you didn't look at other artists' work. You'll be you'll be. It's like re, it's reinventing the wheel. You know, the wheel's already been re- invented. Just if you've been if you're blind, and you've never seen a wheel, and you create a wheel, uh, a wheel, it's not going to be a great creation because. They're all over the streets. We've got streets <laughs> all over the world for these wheels. All right. <laughs> so no, it's not. You're not going to be a genius because you reinvented something. Uh, so don't put blinders on. You want to see as much art as you can see. You want to listen to as much music as you want to listen to. You want to. Th- you want to read and think. You know. You want to cultivate your mind. It's all about culture. Culture is about growing, expanding, uh, discovering. Uh, but yes. So no one's no one's uh, an island. No one's born in a vacuum. You've got roots, and it's going to come out whether you plan on it or not. It yeah. naturally comes out. I think also it's like the kind of thing where you shouldn't uh, be hesitant about that in any way because the things that are going to really knock you out and really send you into a new sort of uh, vision about what your life force is about and your art art uh, pursuit is. I mean, I think about like you know, people don't realize like, you know, Miles Davis, you know, was so driven by Stockhausen, you know, or like it, it, it it can come from any other culture or any other way. Like Dwayne Allman, Dwayne Allman was working on the coal train. Right. Yeah, that's right. Dwayne Allman's audience, they didn't know coal train and coal train was only 10 years earlier, Uh, but it was a different audience. So, so yeah, um, Listen to Van Morrison sing. You know what he's doing? He's imitating a saxophone. Mm-hmm. Every time he sings, think saxophone. You'll hear it. You know, Clapton once said that he would listen to uh, Little Walker blues records, uh, Little Walker playing a harmonica. And he's like, well, how do I translate into guitar? And he says, if I'm ever stuck for an idea, I just listen to some Little Walker harmonica. You know, so, this is so funny. Who would connect those dots? You you want to talk about like parallels? Like so, the last uh, episode of our podcast, we had Jeff Coffin on, who's the sax player from Bela Fleck and the Flecktones back in the day, and then also he's been with Dave Matthews Band for many many years now, and does a lot of uh, intense jazz work and a lot of other things. But he was just telling us last week about how um, if you listen to uh, he had a conversation with Wayne Shorter about uh, his voicing and, uh, on the saxophone and, and some tone, and he was talking about how he was emulating harmonica. Who was it, though, Joe? Do you remember? It was somebody, it was some harmonica player, but basically he was just talking about how he derived from Wayne Shorter that, uh, that he had, was emulating the voicings of this, this harmonica, and then now he can't listen to it in, in certain without ways. hearing the harmonica yeah yeah and it's it's about and i think it's interesting too like when you when but you, i have no problem when i listen to van morrison if i hear a saxophone coming out of van's mouth i yeah. like it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah thing. yeah there's a lot of i mean there's a lot of musicians that have, have taken that route too like guitar players that play like horn players especially you know you think about like sonny Chirac or people like that and and it's like uh, and even further sort of homage, I think, or an emulation in whatever you, way you want to call it, because now they're in a position where they're not even constrained by human breath, right? Like, you know, uh, they're, they're actually holding and, and f- changing their phrasing based on 
pauses and interjections that would that would only a person that was trying to breathe through an instrument would have. But that becomes mm-hmm. the the platform right. a lot of, for that extra sort of musicality that they're looking for. And so they adopt those sensibilities. Frizzell's another one, you know, uh, where where they, they pick up on a lot of that things, uh, a lot of those things. Uh, I, I love that. I mean, that's that's kind of what we do on this this podcast anyway, sort of try to draw draw the lines to, together a little bit. So, I mean, I love I that. I wanted to mention to do with the the fighting aspect yeah that that frank did practice a little martial arts he didn't do it he was he also when he was young he played baseball and he he was offered to go uh to the the bush leagues for training Mm -hmm. and uh to see uh but i i think the first child had just been born and he he says "I, i couldn't leave my wife with a newborn baby you know, for multiple months, but I think that was the only thing he ever regretted. Hmm. And, and he said, you know, and he, he would talk to me about missing playing ball. And I said, well, you wouldn't want to not have created this art. He says, yeah, but an artist can paint for decades, a baseball mm-hmm. player plays for a short while. Yeah. But later at, when his kids were probably teens they spread some years uh but uh, probably most of them were in, probably in their late teens he did start taking some karate classes and his uh, instructor was quite uh, amazed at his ability and wanted to like uh put him on tour and he's like are you kidding me i'm almost <laughs> i'm almost 50 years old i'm not gonna turn into a martial artist you know i'm just doing this for a little exercise yeah uh but he, he, but he also did a lot of fist fighting in Brooklyn when he was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so there, yeah. So there, there's your fighting. There's your fighting. It's not just in the art, kids. You got to <laughs> feel it. And we, people would talk like all, going back to his comics in the fifties. Like if Rosetta painted or drew somebody throwing a punch, you could feel that impact. You know, he knew where that weight went, where you throw the weight. Mm-hmm. And the impact it has when it hits, you know, and and when it hits, where's what's the shock wave going to be through that body of the victim? So you know, <laughs> sometimes you got to live it before you can paint it. <laughs> <laughs> See another quotable quote. That's a that's a really good one. Well, I mean, it is. You got to you got to do what you know, and that goes for any craft or anything. Like you you have to do your experience. You have to do what is you and. Uh, if you're trying to feign anything, it will be very easily found out and perceived. You know, it's you, you got to do your thing. So I, I, want, <laughs> I want to give a shout out to the uh, uh, Frazetta Art Museum in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. That is run by Frank Frazetta Jr. and his family. And it is the uh, largest collection of Frazettas that you can see on display anywhere. They're, you know, shut down right now because of the uh, the COVID shutdown, but they will be open. And uh, if anyone's looking to get the book internationally, we're Vanguard from our website. We're only shipping in the United States, but the Frazetta Museum in East Stroudsburg, PA, they're, they are shipping internationally, as are some of our other friends, uh, friends and dealers around the world. Yeah, that's rad, man. So where, so if people, we, we don't have to wrap up right now, but since you brought it up, uh, what's the, for people in the States, what's the best place for them to go right now? It, the book isn't actually available yet, right? But they can pre-order it. Is that correct? Yeah, we're, we're taking pre-orders. The book is printed. It's, it's, uh, it's on a ship heading toward America right now. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> we expect it. We expect it to land. Uh, can you see it on the blinds front. behind you? Can you open the blinds behind you and see? The boat? <laughs> See the boat coming? <laughs> <laughs> when I was in New York on the shore, I could, but, you know, with the COVID, I'm not sure I want to be in New York right now. And my heart goes out to everybody there, uh, uh, friends and people I don't know, but because, uh, uh, you know, they're 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 taking it uh, more than anybody. Um, mm-hmm. as some of the Pacific Northwest got it hit really, really hard, too, even more than the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. So uh, our heart goes out to them. But uh, the books are coming in at the end of this month, June, and it will take uh, probably a week to get them to the distributors and then at least another week for the distributors to get them out to the stores. Uh, so I would say 
somewhere between the middle of July, July 15th to July 20th. Amazon will probably get their allotment. Now, they're only carrying the regular edition. We have a deluxe edition. Mm -hmm. has another of his most famous paintings on the cover. This is called The Death Dealer. Mm -hmm. And for, for some people, this is even more famous than, than his Conan paintings or John Carter and Morris paintings, things like that. In fact, this actually ran as uh, one of those Molly Hatchet covers. It also ran as a cover to uh, American Artist magazine back in the 70s, which was unheard of because that was a fine art magazine. And for a someone considered an illustrator to have the cover of a fine art magazine was pretty revolutionary. That's right. Uh, so that deluxe edition is signed by myself, uh, the author, and also Frank Frazetta Jr., and it's got 16 extra pages and a slipcase with that unique Death Dealer cover. But those those are really selling out fast. Uh, I think they're going to be about gone. But the regular edition is a very reasonable $39.95. It's a big, big, nice hardcover book, and available in hardcover only. Nice, thick paper, quality printing. Um, what are the dimensions that, on that? That's really nice size. It, yeah, it's uh, it's fourteen. Uh, it's ten and a half by fourteen, and, and a little more than fourteen and a half. Beautiful. Yeah, right. And, uh, yeah, this is is the largest. Most of the earlier presented books were either eight and a half by eleven or nine by twelve. There was uh, uh, some books uh, in the nineties uh, from Underwood that were nine by twelve. That's a very good series too, and um, and these kind of this one and this one, I'm kind of looking back and paying a little homage to the first. Frazetta series that started in 75 and those were actually the best-selling Frazetta books ever and and uh, so I'm using that as a little inspiration but we're we're bumping it up we're bumping all the quality up better paper larger size better uh, reproductions new new state-of-the-art photos frequently some of them we found vintage transparencies to reproduce from but we did new scans and then others we did totally new high-res uh, digital photography on and then, and we're so better quality painting, printing, bigger, better quality paper, all the good stuff, and bells, nice bells and whistles, bells and whistles all around. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, and like you said, you're talking about like smelling the oil of a of a painting. I the thing I love about you know fine art books like like uh, like this one is like when you get that book and you open it up for the first time and you can smell the printing on the the you know of the yeah. of all the the beautiful photos or the beautiful illustrations or whatever. It's just that's really one of the great pleasures of 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 uh, you know actual books you know that you can never get from a tablet or something like that. You know they make air fresheners that have that new car smell. When are they gonna make? <laughs> when are they gonna make an air freshener that has that new art book smell? <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're giving out your precious IP right now, over live, over the airwaves right now. Like people are writing that. That's a. He's right. That's a good idea. <laughs> I've got other ideas that I've been biting my tongue on. <laughs> I have mentioned in interviews ideas before, and someone else just jump on it a lot quicker, and, and you know, get that thing to get that thing to market. Well, uh, so is there uh, any other information that people you feel like you really want to make sure that people well, get Van from this? The Vanguard website is vanguardpublishing.com. So that's real easy to remember. Vanguard, that's V as in Victor, A-N-G-U-A-R-D, vanguardpublishing.com. And, we'll, and we'll put it in the show notes as well for everybody. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, again, if you're ordering outside the United States, then look for – do a Google search for the Frazetta Museum website in East Roudsburg, Pennsylvania, and that's ran and operated by Frank Frazetta Jr. and his family. They, they are doing international orders as well as domestic – uh, and we have, they're also offer, being offered through your local comic shop. You've got a comic shop you visit or know where one's in the neighborhood, but you never stopped in. This could be an excuse to go in there and say hi to somebody. Now, a lot of them aren't open, reopened yet. Right. But uh, if you do, if you have gone there before, a lot of them are filling orders. Uh, or if you ask for a book, they can get it for you. They may bring it out. Curb service. That's right. Hand it to you through the door call. of the car. <laughs> That's right. Call it from the parking lot. Like, bring me the book. That's <laughs> right. I need my art fix, man. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point because a lot of, a lot of, uh, I've seen, I've seen various, you know, uh, 
you know, new new comics coming out and stuff, and and a lot of the ads or the you know the posts I've seen on social media have suggested like talk to your local comic shop first, you know, and see if you can't get this yeah. through them because that way we you can support, support them. We want to support them. You know, Amazon is doing so well. They're making money left and right. Yeah, and and that's, you know, there are some people who have been shut in that they have, they may be in a rural area and they have a uh, few options uh, that are open to get even food. So right. so they're, they're doing a service, you know. Uh, but the local individually owned mom and pop comic shops you know those there's there's real culture in those stores that you that you don't get elsewhere and, and we always we always want to support those local comic shops that is a that's a, a den of cult of unique culture and i wanted to mention really quick you you've said it a few times now but the frazetta museum website is at frazettamuseum.com and for anybody who's who's new to this whole discussion it's f r a Z E T T A Frazetta museum.com is where you can find out more about Frank Frazetta and where you could also look into this new book more besides the Vanguard website. I think the most common mispronunciation of his name is Franzetta. You know, oh. I get a lot of people come up. Oh, I love that Franzetta or Franzetti <laughs> or Franzetti or, you know, there was a pizza. There's a pizza brand out there called Freshetta. And I'm like, the first time I heard that, I'm like, come on, man. that's getting really close. Is that Frank? Is that Frank Freshetta? Are you, are you being frank about your pizza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Savage pepperoni flavor. That's, that's right. Oh, there is also a Conan's Pizza that's been open in Austin, Texas, since the '70s, and and they decorated the whole place has been de is decorated with posters by Frazetta. Oh, that's rad. Now that is an attraction right there. Yeah, I, Franzetta, like it's it's not box wine, it's not frozen pizza, it's <laughs> yeah. Frazetta. Awesome. Well, uh, hey, so thanks a lot, man. I mean, I can't, I really appreciate you taking the time, and I know that it's uh, you're super busy, and you've actually been having to do some some running around during COVID, uh, and I'm just glad that you're safe and that you're well, and uh, you know. Uh, everybody, please check the show notes. We'll have all the links for you and everything. And this is this is a really important thing to, to you know. And this is scratching the surface, honestly, of everything that you you've done. Uh, you know, your your laundry list of 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 accomplishments and roles and things that you've done is really really something to take note of. And so you, you know, you as much as you are sort of in support of uh, of this you know of other people's work or or, or a work. Or, you're, you're a piece of work yourself. <laughs> that's, one, that's one way to put it. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're going to get out of here. Uh, we'll do like a little uh, outro and then you guys hang on. We'll do a little uh, uh, green room hang afterwards. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Please subscribe. Please uh, share and do all those things. And most importantly, just take care of yourselves. All right. We are, we are out. Thank you. Thank you.